Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Wonderful to see you all tonight. We're going to start uh, with uh, some words from Gary uh, and some music behind that from his wife, Lauren. So let's go ahead and start with that. Contexts. Chant the beginning. At the beginning, before Christ was, before Coyote, before Raven stole light from its box, or Wolf nursed the boisterous twins, before the first dawn, or the first evening, or oldest man's oldest thought, before mountains or rivers, before the power of the word to open up the world. Before all that, moving through the vast silence, there was number, pulse, numbers ordering themselves in time, becoming time made tangible, becoming music and word, form and formation of ourselves. Without music, Word is not complete. The form is not comely. Without word, idea is but a part. The formation is not complete. Out of music and the word came life. The single rhythmic line along the backs of buffalo at last go. The antelope painted by Bushmen on the rock walls above the felt. The medicine shields of the crows in the cottonwood country. Out of music and the word Everything that was to come came. The first music to come was a song. It 
It had the power of songs to give the world a comely form. The first song was The Creation. The first word to come was a name. It had the power of names to become us. The first word was the people. Welcome. That was beautiful, wasn't it? Welcome, everyone to this uh, event I've been looking forward to for quite some time. My name is Cameron perez Rodia. Uh, I'm originally from Wutkayagovic, formerly known as Barrow. Um, I serve as president and CEO of the Alaska Humanities Forum, and, uh, and Gary was a very, very important person to me, someone who I looked up to and, and, um, and just loved being around. So I'm really looking forward to, to, to tonight. A few things to just know as we move forward. Uh, I want to take a moment to recognize that we are on Denina land, and it's important that we recognize and remember and know that the Denina people have been for thousands of years and continue to be stewards of this land. So it's important that we recognize that. Also, that um, we have people tonight who are in person, you, and people that are remote. So welcome in whatever form you're here. We are going to um, have three sections to our, to our evening. The first is literature and humanities. The second, environmental concerns. And third is Alaska Native education and land claims. So in each of those sections, there will be people who will come up or will, who will speak um, from the screen here and share their memories, their thoughts, their, um, um, the things that they connect to Gary. Uh, the first section is Literature and the Humanities, and the first to speak is Steve Limbeck to talk about the work at the Alaska Humanities Forum, followed by Stephanie Holdhouse, Luis Alberto Urea, and Ron Spatz. So let's welcome up Steve Limbeck. Well, what a treat. Um, once again, I get to follow Gary Holdhouse, and that's kind of a tough act, but a great joy as well. I'm honored to be in your company tonight and to have a few words and be in communion with so many dear colleagues. Gary, I'm sure, would be very pleased, and as we know, he is with us in soul and spirit tonight. So I think I'm here because I had the honor and privilege to be the direct link to his work at the Alaska Humanities Forum. I followed him in the role as executive director, and he left very large, easy footsteps to follow. Happily for me, Gary had already long been the most generous, imaginable mentor and friend, and he continued to do that before, during, and after my time at the Forum. He began his work at the Forum in 1972, and for those of us who were here, we remember a place that was brand new. It was a time of hope. It was a time of great ambition in the new state and a lot of energy to build a better future, we hoped. And the forum under Gary's leadership was involved in all of that, all over the state. It was also a time when, as I hope we can still say now, Alaskans tried to look out for each other. I remember he told me about arriving in Anchorage in the winter without adequate clothing, and he was sent downtown to see Perry Green about fixing that. So if you don't know furs, know your friends. <laughs> well, Gary made friends everywhere he went. It would have gotten pretty hard for him to know all of them, but he did. Just after I started at the Forum, we decided to hold a 20th anniversary celebration, and it grew and grew. 
And before long, we had celebrations going on in six different communities in six different ways with local interpretations of what people knew and loved about the Humanities Forum. At that point, I had never been to Kotzebue, so I went there for the big event. It was held in the high school gymnasium, which was the biggest room in town. And I sat in the bleachers just agog as the people of Kotzebue came to celebrate Gary's good work from 20 years past. They knew it, they remembered it, they celebrated it for two hours. Now, Gary was the master of what we called the regrant project. It was essentially taking federal money and regranting it out to people doing something good and interesting in our community in humanities based work. So it was films and books and oral histories and research and dance festivals, language preservation exhibits, and so on. Community building, always community building. Gary was really good at it. He made regrants a creative, even artistic process. Still, there came a time when we felt that other tools and techniques were needed to move forward and to evolve the organization. And happily, the organization has continued to grow and change and evolve and is now one of the very best of its kind in the country because that work has paid fruit in many, many ways that people have, have created imaginatively. But the change didn't come easily to the board. I went to a conference in Minneapolis once where my colleagues from around the country were going through the same kind of growth pains. Gary was there. I began my remarks by paying tribute to Gary's work with regrants and then going on to discuss some of the other ideas and struggles that we were having about figuring out how to embrace change. I believed in the changes, but I was a little worried Gary might think that we were uh, leaving his great legacy behind. I was wrong about that. When the session was over, Gary came bounding over to my place at the table and he pointed a finger right in my face and said, you tell your board that if they refuse to change, they dishonor it. And yes, Gary was the most generous mentor and friend. It was perfectly in character of Gary to say, let go of what we did in order to do something better. So I admit I was spoiled by what he had created at the Humanities Forum. I've now been around nonprofits and their boards for more than 30 years. That was my first tour of duty. So I've been an employee, an executive director, a board member, a board chair, an advisor, a reviewer, a consultant, and so on. I finally wound up writing a master's thesis on, quote, hallmarks of superior performance of nonprofit boards of directors. Unfortunately for me, it wasn't considered a valid research topic to simply say, I inherited the best board you'd ever seen, and here's why. But I'll tell you, at the Alaska Humanities Forum, the core values were very clear, and the board enforced them diligently. It was interesting and fun to be there. Everybody contributed. People looked forward to getting together. They showed up and did their homework to get there. They, they worked Objects together. Chant the beginning. Oops. <laughs> Gary's here. He's in spirit and soul. <laughs> anyway, people, they, they worked together and they brought their wisdom and they learned from each other. They were a real community. And I believe that it was Gary's language and demeanor and example that made these things happen. He always had a chuckle rumbling around in his throat. Sometimes it was appreciative or admiring or rueful or even admonitory, but always, always it was gentle and supportive. Gary thought deeply about communities and how they can be healthy. He wrote eloquently, as we've already seen, on matters of the heart. He raised money for really important work. It wasn't the, matter, the money that mattered, it was the work. And he always nurtured other people in doing that work. So to those of us here who stood with him, thank you for your love of Gary, for the Alaska he dreamed about, for the work that we can all do still to keep his legacy alive and strong. It is the best work that I ever had, and it's certainly not finished. Thank you.
I'm going to read two of Dad's poems, unless he's going to interrupt me and do it for us. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, Dad loved words. He loved words for their ability to help us express beauty, gratitude, joy, and sorrow. And he loved words for the way they help us tell our stories, the stories that help us understand ourselves, each other, and the world around us. Dad used poetry to tell his own story and the story of our shared humanity. I chose these two poems because the first demonstrates his craftsmanship and ability to speak to our common desire for home. And the second is about the writing of poetry and shows how he could use words so sparingly and still deliver deep insight into the creative process. What it comes down to, if I could anchor myself here and go down deeper and deeper in this one place, a time would come, perhaps, when I could penetrate even this unyielding, indifferent earth. Find here what remains unknown, a name for that nameless absence we seek to fill, an end or point to our own long absence from home. Writing the poem Trying for some clean economy, these are the things I left out. The arduous journey, the drifts, the boot, the pain, any discussion of death. What was left was hope for essence of movement, of cold, of emptiness and loss. The idea, lean as a needle, sharp as the edge of shadow. Trying to close with that thing straining towards me, the ultimate openness, the poem without words, the indelible thing itself. Hi, I'm Luis Urrea. I'm uh, on the road like I often am. I feel that I was sent on the road by Gary Holthouse. Um, I'm in Florida. So it's kind of late out here being a grandpa, you know. But I just wanted to point out that this hotel has a nice Spanish painting behind me that says, Hola. And I've been sitting here thinking, that should say Holthouse. It almost does. I think Gary would appreciate it. I first met Gary. Uh, in Boulder, Colorado, I hadn't published really any books. And uh, I'd gone to Boulder to get an MFA because I thought if I'm going to teach English, I might as well go get an MFA. And um, I was in a poetry class taught by Linda Hogan, the great Chickasaw novelist and poet. And the great thing she did was bring poets in. And there were all these Colorado poets and she told us, I've got this guy from Alaska. And uh, you're, you're going to love meeting him. And this big man came in and sat at the end of the table. And, uh, you know, Gary was always the same kind of person that he was that first day I met him. And he started reading poetry to us he read parts of circling back and other works and it was really good but i've got to tell you that the 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 gentle bodhisattva vibe uh hit a lot of power in gary and when he began to read he read a a, a poem that had a chant element to it and he started actually drumming on the table and getting louder and louder. And I fell in love with him. I said, I love this guy. I don't know. This man's amazing. He was at the Center for the American West. So I, I kind of sought him out. We sought each other out. We'd eat lunch together. And uh, I was researching what became the hummingbird's daughter. Um, and I got close to Vine Deloria Jr., the great Lakota writer and thinker and i realized that he and gary were great friends 
And I didn't realize this until later, but Vine Deloria, if you knew him, was a very crabby man and difficult to get close to. But he opened his world to me and he opened his heart to me. And he started introducing me to healers and medicine people from all kinds of traditions and inviting me to their gatherings and things uh, to help me with the book. And I didn't realize until later that it was Gary Holdhouse who was telling him, help this young man. And I, it didn't hit me until after the book came out, my book started publishing and I went back to Boulder on book tour and he, Gary, was having lunch with Vine Deloria and they just were like my grandpas. They smiled. They said, I'm proud of you, young man. And I thought, oh my God, Gary's involved with this. We went on the road together. We did readings together. We did lectures together, um, you know, down at Still Point, all over Colorado. Um, and he always pushed Alaska on me. I was so proud of myself that I was in the Rockies. And he said, you like mountains? And I said, I do. And he said, well, wait till you go to Alaska. <laughs> and he asked me, how do you like the winter up here? And I said, it's very impressive. And he said, wait till you come to Alaska. He always wanted me to come to Alaska. You know, one of the first things he told me about Alaska, you better read John Straley. <laughs> it, was, it was a gift. Um, and he traveled, you know, he had his events once he left Colorado, like I did. Um, but we'd see each other, we'd cross paths, we'd write to each other or, or whatever. And um, when he was in Salado, Texas, we Mexicans call it Salado in Texas, but Salado, Texas. And he wanted me to come up there and talk uh, at his center. And, um, you know, I, I want to say a little detail about Gary that I I found in my own life um, that some of you probably felt too, that he was so open to wonder. I don't want to call it miracles, but small miracles, wondrous things and weird things. Sometimes Gary was kind of a weirdness generator. And so Salado, I thought this is really fascinating. I'm going to go to Texas and, and I, I had to take a limousine. There's a several hour limousine drive through backcountry Texas. And the limousine driver came to pick me up and he took my bag. He said, I'm going to put this in the trunk. And he opened the trunk and he had a full machine gun in the trunk. And I was looking at it and he saw me and he closed the trunk and he said, son, I drive hours and hours back here by myself. And I'm not going to drive them alone. I said, no, I understand, sir. You know, so I got there. The center was lovely, was wonderful as usual, seeing Gary again. Um, and while we were talking, people came, they listened to us speak. All of a sudden the janitor came in. This is one of my quintessential Gary moments. He came in, he had a box and he set it on a table. And we said, what do you got? And he said, I got Pancho Villa's death mask. <laughs> we were like, you what? So no, I got Pancho Villa's death mask. You want to see it? We're like, yeah, yes. And he opened the box and it was Pancho Villa's death mask with bullet holes. And he says, look real close. There's still hair sticking out. Of it. And I remember just looking at Gary. We were just looking at each other like, what exactly is happening? And he said, I'll sell to you for $6,000. <laughs> Uh, we, we turned him down, but I wish I bought it. But those kind of delightful moments happened over and over. And I remember a very touching thing. And then I want to tell you my last memory of him personally, physically. Um, at Still Point Institute, you know, sort of a Zen meditation Taoist place that Gary was helping. Um, we went and we were speaking to people and there were a bunch of women that came, professional women and moms and teachers, and they all had the dream of being writers. And Gary and I were supposed to be the bodhisattvas that day, you know, and tell them about writing and the possibility of writing. And the women began to cry because many of them, they were, like I said, moms and basically thwarted writers like we all are. 
And it was so great to be beside the great bear of Gary because they were truly suffering. And, you know, we were able to tell them, me taking cues from him, that you have always been writing. You're writing now. You may not have put it on paper yet, but you know when you're a writer and that's why you're crying. And we have to help you get it on paper. It was so, it was so gentle and, and beautiful, you know? Um, and the last time I saw him personally was with Carol and Servit there in uh, uh, Sitka uh, the last year that she was running her, her symposium and workshop. Um, and we were in the big, the big building at the school on the, on the campus there at Sitka. And he was across the hall from us. And we hadn't seen each other for a very long time. <clears throat> and I was able to introduce my daughter to him. And if you want to introduce a great uncle figure to your child, it's Gary. Um, and there was a reading room. And I would go out in the reading room and read. And one afternoon, I was reading. Well, it was probably mid-morning. And I was reading, and I looked up, and Gary was out in the hall in his bathrobe looking at me. His hair was, and I said, what's going on, Gary? And he said, I locked myself out of my room. And we could not stop laughing. We left 20 minutes or more. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, I don't know either. What if, is there a janitor? He said, I don't know. And he wandered off with it. And I could hear him laughing all the way down the stairs. So maybe he found Carol. Somebody saved him. But that was the last time I saw him. And, it, you know, I always thought we'd see each other again. But I thought, this guy, just think he called it into existence. You got to go to Alaska. You got to read John Straley. I think he asked me, did you go find John Straley <laughs> when he got to to Sitka. Now I go back to Alaska as often as I can. And I just want to say that, you know, I was feeling so sad when he passed and alone because he was such an all encompassing spirit. And then I realized he's not gone. He's not gone. He's, he's here with all of us all the time. He hasn't gone away. We may not see him, but you know, I hear his laugh. So I just want to say I'm so thankful to have known Gary. I've loved his work. He helped me so much. Um, and I just want to say, don't tell them I said this. He was a better writing teacher than all the writing teachers at the University of Colorado. But that's the gospel truth. So thank you for having me to this. I love you, Gary. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> My name is uh, Ronald Spatz, and I have a dual role. I'm going to be speaking for Gary Snyder as well as for myself. Um, and we're going to start with letting, for the record, everybody know who Gary Snyder is. Pulitzer Prize winning poet, environmentalist, educator, Zen Buddhist, author of more than 20 collections of poetry and prose was a friend and colleague of Gary Holthouse and a great admirer of Gary Holthouse's work as a poet, writer, environmentalist, and humanist. Snyder wanted to be represented at this event this evening, but was unable to participate remotely. He mailed us this short reflection to read that begins when he met Gary Holthouse in Bush, Alaska, and I'll read it off my phone. My first time at Gary Holthouse's place, dark winter night, I flew in on deep, soft snow. Gary took me out to look at the snow-covered deer he'd shot in the afternoon with a long, muzzle-loaded single shot. He left it from that afternoon. After a couple of more days, we went to a small settlement a few miles upriver from the nearby coast. These high school boys sang strong traditional songs in language and talked and read poems in Americano. And then I tripped and fell into the river water 
and it was a big funny joke. Over the years, I returned many times to talk of humanities programs and more. Gary was a fine poet, and we compared notes on a host of subjects. I understood that he was purer than me, but artists overcome such minor problems. This wise, calm, big man did his life generously well and is an inspiration for us all. And that's from Gary Snyder. Indeed, Gary Holthouse was a big man who, in my view, evidenced greatness. His works were known nationally and inside of Alaska. In Alaska, he worked one person at a time to build connections throughout the entire state. When I met him in 1981, I knew nothing about Alaska. I had just been here for six months. Didn't have really any mentors to clue me in. And Gary actually, over time, was the kind of mentor that was accidental. If you hung around with him, you learned a lot of things. And as was said earlier, he was completely generous with his time and his wisdom. What Gary did was laid the foundation of the humanities and arts in Alaska in a institutional way. That is something that didn't exist before. He made and forged the essential connections necessary to bring Alaska's diverse, diverse communities together. When I came, we wanted to do events. He introduced me to the communities and their different cultures. And the thing that was amazing that you could see, even in Anchorage, in his little basement office downtown with Max, his one administrator, it was like a crossroads of Alaska. People, if you had an appointment with him, you could be treated to any number of different kinds of exemplars coming from different parts of the bush or in town or people he knew from outside. And this wove a fabric for us, us newbies, um, that was invaluable. Gary and I worked together um, for many years. We brought writers to different communities. We worked on Alaska Native writers, storytellers, and orators. Um, Gary was the main content editor with the Dowin Hours, who he brought on board. Amazing in everything that he knew. And I loved his writing. Um, he was a big supporter of our project, Alaska Quarterly Review, a project that uh, Jim Lishkin and I founded back in 1980. He was a cheerleader, but the thing about it was he was already a very accomplished poet with his first book out in like 1979 from the Copper Canyon Press. He was already at a level that there were very few people maybe John Haynes, maybe a couple of other people. That was it. And um, he was very, very humble about his work. That's something that everybody ought to know about Gary. He was humble. You never heard him brag. So it was hard to squeeze poems out of him. <laughs> it was hard to find out what he was doing. And so I'm going to conclude with um, a poem that I first read probably 37 years ago when it was fresh, in that little office, in the basement of a building downtown here. I don't know if Max was there or not. He said, here, what do you think of these? Just like that, and took a look at it, and it just astonished me how absolutely amazing they were, hot off the press. And I asked them if we could, you know, if it were OK, if we could publish them in Alaska Quarterly Review. Oh, he said, sure, sure, I'd love that. He said, it's so good. He was always the cheerleader. He'd tell you right there to boost you up that things were good. And um, I read it over for this event, and it moves me just as powerfully as it did when I read it 37 years ago. It's a poem about his father taking his last flight. Um, and um, not literally flight, that's the metaphor, 
but flight from the old age home, from the nursing home. And um, I'm going to read it now. Last flight. Oh, and I want to say one other thing before I get to it. He won all kinds of awards that haven't been mentioned from the National Endowment for the Arts, all kinds of things for his work. I mean, nationally known in the arts and humanities. And uh, for the work that he published in Alaska Quarterly, he had at least two notable essays of the year in his nonfiction. And so it isn't just that he did these things and they were out there. They made a difference. They were compelling. And they influenced other writers coming along. OK, here's the poem. Last flight, retirement home. Trapped within the kindness of strangers and a dim hall of acquaintances he can't let become friends, Pop woke to say, I'm going to the store. You want to come? And I can hear mom's wonder, since he'll never have a license or a car again, can see him slip out through the glass entry past the circle of peonies in the green lawn along the lilies of the valley to cross the parking lot. The old car he can see now, still parked right where he left it, can hear the spare keys jingle. As if afraid he might be stopped, or perhaps exultant, one last drive toward freedom, only steps away, he lifts a stiff knee higher, begins to run, at least in his own vision of himself, he must be running. But his head gets ahead of himself, and he falls, concrete turning the red blood loose in his skull, while one hip splits, anchors him an hour before he is found. Purse-lipped nurses mewling and bending. And I am trapped, not by the imagination of pain or efforts to rise, but by the thought of that move just before the fall. His white hair, sport coat, too big on this frail body, leaping through winter to slip behind the wheel of the gray old's Delta 88, assume another body, new and clear visioned, an expert again, at ease, handling 5,000 pounds of sleek steel, chance to get away. And I can hear my own breath lunging, my voice yelling from a thousand miles away. Run, Pop, run. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to our next section. Uh, this is uh, work with environmental concerns. First, we'll see a video um, from John Luther Adams. Then uh, Meg Tylston will come up and speak. Then we will hear from Gary Nobhan, and then finally Nancy Lord. So we'll begin with John Luther Adams. I wasn't yet 30 years old when John Haynes shared with me a cycle of poems he was working on and asked if I thought I might find some music in them. I told him, yes. I thought I might. When the State Arts Council declined to fund our collaboration, John suggested that we talk to Gary Holthouse at the Alaska Humanities Forum. Gary readily and enthusiastically agreed to support our work, and his leap of faith made a decisive difference in the course of my life and work. Gary also suggested that we invite Barry Lopez to come to Fairbanks to speak at the premiere. And so began another of the deepest, most enduring friendships of my life. John Haynes and I were grateful to Gary and the Humanities Forum for their support. But with the youthful arrogance of the aspiring artiste, I remember thinking, poetry is art, music is art, the humanities are academic disciplines. What does that have to do with art? On more than one occasion, I asked Gary to tell me just exactly what the humanities are. Quietly and patiently, he would explain. Yet it would still take me many years to begin to understand 
the full breadth and depth of Gary's vision. For Gary, the humanities weren't so much fields of inquiry as they were ways of becoming more fully human. In his writing and his speaking, in his roles as administrator and as minister, Gary practiced a new kind of humanism. Gary's vision of community embraced the broadest range of people regardless of their diverse and divergent views. So very different from the strident clan warfare that prevails in civic discourse today. And Gary held to an ideal of human culture that encompasses the full community of larger than human life on earth. Whenever I read Gary's words, I hear his voice, soft, clear, resonant with generosity, and the beautifully measured cadences of his way of speaking. In Gary's words, you could always hear his faith, the faith he so fully embodied in his life and work, in the way he carried himself in the world. Gary was that rare person who truly walked his talk. Although I lived in the woods outside Fairbanks and Gary was in Anchorage, we saw one another often, and I knew that he was always there for me. After Gary left Alaska, we still saw one another from time to time. I was thrilled when he showed up at a concert of my music in Wisconsin. We sat for hours over dinner, and he gave me an inscribed copy of his Book of Uncommon Prayer that I will always treasure. Several years ago, the Alaska Humanities Forum welcomed Cindy and me back to Alaska to give a public reading and to install my sound and light environment veils and vesper at the Anchorage Museum. Cameron and his team hosted a lovely dinner for us at the top of the hotel with Captain Cook. But once Gary arrived, I'm afraid I became a less than gracious guest because I spent most of the evening huddled in the corner, absorbed in conversation with my dear old friend. To begin my reading at Cyrano's bookshop, Gary gave an introduction that made me blush. And then when he handed me the dog-eared copy of the score of Forests Without Leaves that I'd inscribed to him all those years before, I almost broke down. A couple of nights later, Gary and Lauren, Cindy and I enjoyed a long, leisurely dinner together at a restaurant downtown. That was the last time I saw Gary in the flesh. But like John Haynes, Gordon Wright, and Barry Lopez, Gary is still with me every day, the wise, quiet, steadying presence that he's always been. In Arctic Dreams, Barry writes, And once in a great while, an asumotok becomes apparent, a person who can create the atmosphere in which wisdom shows itself. This is a timeless wisdom that survives human economies. It survives wars. It survives definition. It is a nameless wisdom esteemed by all people. It is an understanding how to live a decent life, how to behave properly toward other people and toward the land. Gary Holthaus was an usumatak. For all of us who have been blessed by his presence in our lives, Gary created an atmosphere in which wisdom continues to reveal itself. And the gifts he has left behind will endure for generations to come. Right, nice. Well, as we have heard, knowing Gary Holdhouse is an experience to be treasured. Gary and I have known each other for many years, and our relationship was rather like rocks rolling down a river, each flowing with the current, sometimes together and sometimes separately, as our various endeavors went at different ways, but always knowing that each other was there and could be called upon. The last time we worked together was on the board of directors 
for Alaska Common Ground, a public policy organization dedicated to involving Alaskans in good government. He was always willing to share his vast knowledge and understanding of Alaska and her people with us and everyone around. It was a wonderful boon for any organization. <clears throat> In reading about Gary, there is seldom a reference to him as an environmentalist. But to me, he was the epitome of one. There are various directions that environmentalists can take. Those that focus on a place, like the, like the Everglades, the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, and Bristol Bay. There are those that use their time on issues such as clean air, clean water, adequate water, wildlife, and climate change. Others expend their energy on the establishment and maintenance of effective and efficient organizations that deal with, with environmental issues. All of these have important roles in the scheme of things. But Gary's perspective was so much broader. He saw all of nature, including people, as one, and as such, must function together as a whole. There is no mistake that he cared about the connection and the interconnections of everything. In all that he has said and wrote, Gary advocated for the environment, not overtly, not stridently, I can't think of Gary as ever being strident, and the relationship of people, place, and all that surrounds us. That is the essential of his being. To me, that's the real definition of an environmentalist. And certainly, Gary was one, whether he ever mentioned it or not. Thank you, Gary. Greetings, Earthlings. I'm so happy that we're here to celebrate someone who so deeply moved um, so many of us and taught us that we can't really conserve or restore any wounded landscape unless we restore it, unless we revive and resurrect its forgotten stories that have made that landscape a place of the heart. And so I've always thought that his unique gift was the way that he understand that indigenous and long-term residents of various landscapes and seascapes have something inevitable to offer to what we feel from that landscape, that, that without their voices, uh, we're impoverished, that without knowing the history of a place, we, we glimpse it through a glass darkly. Like Gary, I uh, grew up in Midwestern farm country, went to the same little college in uh, the land of corn and soy. And I think when we first got together, we realized that we were both sort of weird Midwesterners trying to grapple with the expansiveness of larger landscapes and the diverse cultures within them. And he, like many of you, took me on as an apprentice and the most gorgeous times with them were just bouncing up and down in a pickup truck cab together in vast landscapes as he told stories about them. In one of the essays in Wide Open Skies, he really goes to the heart of this issue that 
as he went down a long valley, um, remembering the families that once lived there, their place names, their stories, their songs, that he felt that something had been lost from that landscape that needed to be recovered to fully celebrate it and to conserve it in the broadest sense. And in that way, I think that Gary embraced the way of environmental humanities, not the discipline or the, or the um, uh, academic fashions of it, but what environmental humanities can be in its richest sense before we had a term for it. Brother Gary practiced the art of ecological poetics uh, even before others talked in that manner about his kind of work because he breathed it every day. He put it down on the paper every time he, he wrote. Those were just those concepts were mused and fused so deeply in him that he didn't even need to use terms like that. And when he preached to us, which he did, even when he was not uh, at a pulpit or a podium, he did so with some sense of a contemplative ecology before that tagline had arrived in American discourse. He not only kept us for, from forgetting the peoples, the uh, cultures of habitat, uh, as I called them once, that were the residents of rural and wild landscapes when he spoke about conservation, but he warned conservationists that they would fail. They would fail in achieving their goals if they stripped the land of those deep dwellers of those landscapes. And in that way, he was at odds with other portions of the um, conservation movement who, who really wanted to um, remove ranches and farmlands from certain environments uh, to allow greater flow of wildlife where he saw farmers and ranchers as participating in the presence of wildlife. I think that he presaged a lot of things that we take for granted now. Uh, the kind of coalition that we saw protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline or the efforts to bring seven tribes together for the protection of bears ears uh, on, in the Four Corners area. The, uh, commitment to involve uh, First Nations as co-managers in parks and wildlife refuges. I don't think we could have arrived at that place without the deep thinking and the advocacy that Gary had that brought so many diverse cultures, rural, wild, urban, to the table together. He made a place at the table for everyone, every discussion he was in was a sacred communion. And I'm so grateful for that. I'm grateful for his inclusiveness, grateful for his contrarian mind uh, that could anger people or frustrate them, I should say. At the same time, they felt his embracing heart. And I never heard a word from Gary Holthouse without feeling that there was some deep spirit that was a motivation for everything he said. His spirit, our spirit, the spirit of the wild, a kind of grace in sharing that so deeply with us that like the very first time I heard him do a two minute dialogue in Sitka, I thought, this man is expressing things in my heart like a soulmate that I myself couldn't express at that time. And I'm just so grateful that like many of you, I'd 
meet them in coffee shops, truck stops, airports, weird, weird little tiny towns where we both uh, would gather from Texas to Minnesota. And he'd introduce me to farmers or ranchers or, or musicians in a way that enriched my life as I'm sure that it enriched all of you. So bless our brother Gary and let us carry him forward in our hearts. I'm honored to be included tonight as just one of so many Alaskans who owe a debt to Gary. I arrived in Alaska as a young person not long after the forum began. Homer in the early 70s was not exactly a hot spot of intellectual activity. And the forum, by funding humanities projects throughout the state, was a major player in public thought. I learned that both the arts and humanities could live in Alaska. Gary was, of course, the face of the forum. He had an amazing skill for creating a true forum in the classical sense, a marketplace for the public's sharing of ideas. In his gentle way, he knew just how to advance an idea or enthusiasm that came from an individual or community into something that would result in people talking together and exploring ideas that led to community building. Without being the least bit pushy, he knew how to suggest contacts, reading materials, or whatever might lead to a well thought out, firmly grounded, and inclusive project. The projects from Gary's 20 years at the Forum are now held in the archives at the Consortium Library here in Anchorage. I recently browsed through the online listing just to see what's there. What an amazing collection. I hope that future historians and scholars make good use of it. I noticed that in the early years, 1973 and 74, Gary put together major efforts regarding land issues and community dialogues about land use. In 1973, the forum sponsored a statewide meeting called Land Bridge to Community, as well as a number of land use workshops. A few years later, a couple of Homer-based projects that I remember centered on growth and development. Then in 1990, with Gary's support, the Pratt Museum in Homer developed the Darkened Waters Profile of an Oil Spill exhibit, which traveled as far as the Smithsonian and was a significant contributor to national dialogue about the Exxon Valdez oil spill, its causes, and its aftermath. During those decades, as a young writer with an interest in the environment, I found a supporter, even a mentor in Gary, even though our interactions were infrequent. He was one of the first people to treat me as a serious writer, someone with ideas worth putting onto paper. One of my sharpest memories is of stopping to see him in the Anchorage office where he gave me two books by Willa Cather, The Professor's House and Death Comes for the Arch Archbishop. He wanted me to see how Cather described landscapes and the relationships of people to them. Another time, much later, Gary loaned me David Abrams' The Spell of the Sensuous, a book that had a lasting effect on my understanding of how we perceive and speak of the more than human world. After he left Alaska, Gary invited me to a writing residency in Minnesota and to speak to a humanities organization in Texas. In a time when Alaska was torn between conservation and development, Gary was never afraid to call himself an environmentalist and to tie caring about the natural world into the meanings of subsistence, sustainability, and spirituality. In his book, Learning Native Wisdom, he wrote, yet we environmentalists talk of the natural world as if there was another unnatural world, end of quote. There's, there is no other world, he said. It's all one sacred world, which deserves, deserves and needs our care. This guiding principle surely is part of Gary's legacy. Thanks. Well, we're on to our third section for tonight. Uh, this is work with Alaska Native Education and Land Claims. Uh, first, we'll hear, hear from Archie Gottschalk. 
and then Ted Chamberlain, uh, Vernita Herdman, and then finally we'll hear from Carolyn Servid. So we'll start with Archie. Uh, good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to share some of my recollections of Gary. Gary was a longtime friend of well over 40 years. I knew him to be fair and open-minded with a knack to facilitate discussion regardless of his own views. His, his strengths. And Gary worked in Alaska at a time uh, when upheaval and change was rampant with significant impacts on rural people. Tonight, I'd like to share a few memories with that in mind. So I thought that I would share where I first met Gary and then move into the time that we were both at the Alaska Methodist University here in Anchorage and talk about later the discussions that we had during his tenure at the Alaska Humanities Forum. I uh, met Gary and Naknik. I was born in Bristol Bay, raised in Naknik, a rural fishing community in the southwest portion of the state. I first met Gary as my teacher in the eighth grade with my white hair. You might realize that that's a few years back. Well, at that time, NACNIC, the school district, was a newly organized district created shortly following the creation of the Bristol Bay Borough. The Bristol Bay Borough itself being the first organized borough in the state. We then were excited about our school and the new teachers. Uh, we even had a basketball team, but no gymnasium. <laughs> we played basketball outdoors and learned to dribble in the school hallways. <laughs> Gary taught in Naknik for one year. Later he returned to give my high school graduation commencement address. He cared about his students. He held a position at the Methodist University and as a young college student in 1969, fresh off the tundra and clueless in the big city, Gary was a familiar face. I received a scholarship to attend the beautiful new campus of AMU and Gary was there recruiting and advising students. Later, as you know, he became the founding director of the Alaska Humanities Forum. During those early years, I enjoyed visits with him to discuss socioeconomic issues in rural Alaska. So just to give you a, a bit more insight to my friendship and discussions with him. As I said, our school in Naknik was a new school. 
and it was there that I first met him. He came to Naknek in 1964, and as I said, he taught for one year. I remember that year. He was a good teacher. He cared about the students, and he encouraged, and he encouraged us. My hometown is a commercial fishing community, and even Gary tried his hand at fishing. He fished with a mutual friend, Hank Ostrowski. If any of you knew Hank, you'd realize that the two were very different personalities. <laughs> Hank was skipper of the Lori K.O., one of the very first fiberglass fishing boats in Bristol Bay. By Hank's account, Gary was not cut out for the sea. <laughs> but as we all know, Gary's purposes and strengths lie in other areas. When I enrolled at AMU, Gary was there recruiting and advising students, helping with degrees in education, and, and giving me a new student in a new environment, a place to visit, study, and have coffee, a place to find a supportive person to talk with. We became friends along with Doric Show, another former director of the Humanities Forum. Anyway, we became friends talking about books and issues, ideas. As founding director of the Alaska Humanities Forum, Gary's work had a great impact on the state. I often visited him at his office. We didn't always agree, but Gary was well-read, a critical thinker, and I often sought him out to brainstorm. We met many hours discussing the issues, for, for example, rural education, economic development, privatization of tribal lands, limited entry fisheries, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, and the formation and function of the new native village and regional corporations, and the newly created Alaska Native Review Commission. Gary and I had interesting discussions on a number of issues, you know, the cultural, political, socioeconomic, and environmental transactions, transitions uh, that impacted the state resulting from the Settlement Act. And in 1983, I convinced the Inuit Circumpolar Conference to sponsor a review of the status and perspectives of Alaska Native communities. The review became known as the Alaska Native Review Commission. It was one, I was one to bring Justice Berger from Canada to Alaska to conduct the review. In fact, with his support, the Alaska Humanities Forum helped fund the work of the commission. To wrap this up, I hope my recollections have shown that Gary might not have been meant for the sea, but his great strengths why in other areas? I would like to say that uh, my heartfelt thanks to the Humanities Forum,
for giving me this opportunity. And thanks to his family. But before I give up this mic, I'd, I'd like to share a anecdote that I think showed or would show Gary's concern for justice and humor. Uh, during the work of the Alaska Native Review Commission, I was invited uh, by a number of priests, Catholic priests, to attend a luncheon that they were having uh, to see if I can convince them to issue a statement of support, which they never did. And I attended. I it was a great lunch. Uh, there was a table full of Jesuits and one non-Jesuit, Monsignor Murphy. A Monsignor Murphy was known to have been a chef, so he, he fixed the sumptuous lunch. Uh, we all ate, drank wine. Uh, the wine uh, had come in from Yugoslavia, carried by one of the Jesuits, I rather suspect. But they knew I was there to make a pitch to see if I, to, to, to encourage them to, 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 to come out with a statement, you know, similar to the, the statement that the Russian Orthodox Church had issued. And I, you know, and during, during lunch, you know, there's, there's not much time to fit in between mouthfuls. So anyway, I, I tried several, several occasions to, to, try, to try start the discussion on social justice in rural Alaska and the, uh, the rights of the various groups of people. It didn't take off, no matter how hard I tried. So I realized what was up. I was being given the bums rush, the Pope's rush. <laughs> and uh, so I had already eaten maybe half of my plate. And so I took a fork load and bent over the table. And I looked directly at Monsignor Murphy. And I said, Monsignor, Monsignor, do you suppose that Lazarus the beggar died a fat man? And the table went silent. No one said a thing. And lunch continued. I, after lunch, the next day, I walked in and saw Gary. I relayed that to him. And uh, I, I said, you know, uh, do you suppose that Lazarus, Lazarus, the beggar, died a fat man? Gary threw up his arms off his, off his chest off his chair and, and let out a good laugh. And he said, you'll never be invited back. <laughs> well, it's a privilege to be here. I'm with uh, a number of friends and lots of folks I had met long ago and, and remember fondly. Uh, and, uh, and to be here with Gary. I'll begin with a few lines from a prose poem Gary knew by a poet he admired. The poem was called Grace, and the poet is Joy Harjo. One morning as the sun struggled to break ice and our dreams had found us with coffee and pancakes in a truck stop along Highway 80, we found Grace. I could say Grace was a woman with time in her hands, or a white buffalo escaped from memory. But in that dingy light, it was a promise of balance. We once again understood the talk of animals and spring was lean and hungry with the hope of children and corn. 
a promise of balance from a life that knew all about coffee and pancakes and a truck stop along the highway. That is the promise Gary Holdhouse offered all of us. I first met Gary in Sitka one morning, of course, with coffee and pancakes, at a time when many things seemed out of balance, particularly education and what I call homeland security for Indigenous people. With unique grace, Ari, Gary used his deep knowledge and wide experience of life, along with his stubborn honesty, transparent humility, and his love of laughter to bring the storytelling of settler society into conversation with the languages and liturgies of indigenous storytelling. And he did so in ways that also recognize the place that stories and songs have in all education, at all levels, in all communities, and highlighted the role of stories and songs in land claims. For educational inspiration, Gary drew on indigenous traditions which he greatly admired, but also on those nourished during the early years of the last century in New York by the People's Institute, the public libraries, the Cooper Union, and the Labor Temple, bringing together people from diverse communities to read and listen to stories and to each other. These gatherings and their celebration of what were often radically different storytelling traditions were at the heart of Gary's ideal. But he knew that in practice, they required something beyond learning how to read. They required learning how to listen. Gary had many gifts, but one of them was that he was one of the best listeners I've ever known. The literary critic Philip Hobsbawm, who taught the Irish Nobel laureate Seamus Heaney at Queen's Belfast, was once asked what he remembered most about Heaney. He listens replied Hobsbawm. He can make people make sense by the quality of his attention. Gary was like that. Witness his collection, Eight Days in Autumn, a gathering of overheard conversations and understated stories presented with everyday, everlasting eloquence. But Gary had something else, the ability to make the rest of us into good listeners and good readers too, by the way in which he spoke and wrote and by respecting us, for he never took to speaking or writing as though we were hard of hearing or stupid, as many advocates do, even when we were both, as we often were. And he always spoke and wrote with a firm belief, not only in a balance between reading and listening and between indigenous and settler storytelling traditions, but a belief in a balance between the material and the spiritual, which has been mentioned a number of times in by previous speakers. He believed that spirituality was at the heart of what we call the humanities, humanities much more broadly conceived than our current educational systems encourage, but humanities that hold our communities together and bring them into conversation with other communities and other humanities traditions, such as those that help recover an indigenous homeland that honors the ancestors, honors the land, and honors the promises that were made. All such stories, he believed, are necessary for spiritual as well as material subsistence. And in land claims, they become sources and centers of sovereignty. Nowhere did I see this more tested sternly, more sternly tested and displayed more clearly than in the enterprise that's been mentioned already, especially Barge, uh, the Alaska Native Review Commission, led by Tom Berger. Gary made a breakthrough for the commission. Again, this has been mentioned with his recognition that it could offer more than a public litany of problems following ANCSA, important though these were. As Archie mentioned, Gary put most of the year's Alaska Humanities Council budget into a series of round table discussions implemented with the help of another of my dear friends, Doric Meshaw and others at the commission at the time and designed to bring village Alaska and native Alaskan corporate leaders, along with indigenous elders and community participants from across the Americas, into conversation with a very wide and not by any means all dedicated post-colonial settler scholars from North and South America, 
and giving them the opportunity to express their views and outline their differences on political, legal, and philosophical and spiritual issues, and to listen to each other, which they did with astonishing and admirable respect. They came away refreshed and renewed and of course exhausted. But they also came away, all of them, with new insights and new ideas and new respect. It took courage on Gary's part to make it happen and on all the participants' part to make it work. But Gary was fearless when it came to doing things differently. I always remember a comment at one round table by Browning Pipestone, an indigenous advocate from Oklahoma, who in response to some complaints by Alaskan participants about the difficulty of doing things they wanted to do in the realms of education and healthcare and legal systems. And Browning Pipestem responded fiercely, don't wait for permission, just do them and wait for others to catch up. That was always Gary's way, bless him. And in this, he was in tune with many indigenous leaders then and now. Sometimes others did catch up, sometimes they didn't, but the world was all, almost always better off after. I want to end by, by saying that Lauren Pilon is another wayfinder and wonder worker, and the promise of balance is at the center of her music. She's brought balance and grace to our lives, and I'm certain we've all been inspired <clears throat> by the music and by the way she loved, loved and looked after Gary. Thank you, Lauren. Finally, a comment picking up on Ronald Spatz's uh, lovely uh, uh, reading of, of Last Flight Retirement Home. I had the privilege of uh, publishing that in, in the magazine, the, the most widely read magazine in Canada at the time, a monthly magazine called Saturday Night. Uh, the poem is in an archaeology of home, as many of you will know. And that last line, I'm glad Ronald read it because I always break up when I do run, uh, pops run. But I say now, about to break up, run, Gary, run. Thank you. I send your praying, my phone will stay on while I'm speaking. <laughs> and I want to say hi to Ted Chamberlain and thank him for letting me know that Seamus Haney was a poet and lived. Because years later, I think my quoting Seamus Haney persuaded Mike Carey back then an editor at the Daily News, to publish an op-ed of mine on sovereignty. I attended every one of those round tables. That's where I got my education. Inupagarunga. Vanga diga sedactun suli kutkuk. I asked my mom and dad years ago, Mom, what do my names mean? Because all my life, my mom and dad, my grandma would call me sedactun. And if my dad wanted my attention, he would say kutkuk or if he wanted me to know it wasn't urgent, he would call me good cook. I asked my parents, what do my names mean? And they looked at each other. And they said, your names are so old, nobody know what they mean. They've just been handed down and handed down. My village has been continuously 
on that spot on Norton Sound off the Bering Sea for over 2,500 years. If it were not for Gary, I likely would never have had the chance to hear the late Dr. Walter Soboloff describe himself conversing with the Ravens on a walk through the totem park in Sitka. He said the Ravens replied when he called out words like, baseball, and Coca-Cola. <laughs> the Humanities Forum supported an Alaska Native Writers Conference in Sitka in the early 1980s, where Dr. Soboloff spoke, and others like Nora Dauenauer described, for example, what it is like to use more modern ingredients to make a gudak, better known in the West as Eskimo ice cream. Nora said, one might find oneself out of grated dried rain beer fat and drops of clear seal oil, in which case, she instructed, Crisco would have to do. <laughs> At the same event, I heard the late Catherine Peter sing a song, a lament, in the language of her people, the Gwich'in, for a son lost during World War II. I had no idea who I was at the time. I wrote only sporadically, creatively, that is. I wrote testimony, op-eds, position statements, and the like to the board of Rural Cap and others about issues like subsistence and sovereignty. Before I met Gary and Doric and Carolyn Servid and Ted Chamberlain and ended up serving on Tom Berger's editorial team for Village Journey, before that time, I had worked mostly for a federal agency that constructed water and sewer projects in the villages and I had worked for oil companies, helping them fill their Alaska Native women's and Alaska resident quotas all at one blow. I came to realize my identity through associating with the likes of Tom Berger and through him, Doric Mesho and through Doric, Carolyn, and through them, Gary Holthouse. I found Gary to be quietly dedicated to supporting the determination of our people to guide the education system toward a better understanding of our many villages, their varied cultures, and histories, our values, and our strong desires to remain, remain, remain indigenous against all efforts to assimilate us into Western society. Watching Gary and Doric together I recognize their affection for each other. And observing their many joint efforts, I came to know and believe and feel gratitude that it is possible for non-Native people to value Native people as both separate from Western society 
while also striving for inclusion in the universal community of we who value knowledge in all its forms and wisdom wherever it arises. Gary's life in Alaska was rich and varied, inclusive, and far-reaching. We are all better for his life here and for his work at the Forum. He told me once in Sitka that he appreciated a farewell song. I had sung it at the Sitka clan house. It's derived from an American hymn book, but its words when translated into Inupak evoke our strong faith in the hereafter, which my people believe in just as strongly. We believe in reincarnation. When my mother met my daughter, Ayu Kasadak, she picked her up and said, Hi, Mom. Yun Laklit has had a hard three weeks. There have been a half dozen funerals. I'm going to another one here in town on Saturday. One of the funerals at home was combined service for a woman I knew as a child and her grandson who believed he could not live without her. This song, translated by my mother and others, can be heard at almost every Inupak funeral. But this evening, I'm singing this for Gary because we are celebrating his life. Had he passed away in our village, we would sing it for him. I've always thought that as familiar as the harmony is, its translation into my language changes it. I wish I had some water. Pakim na nuna la na kliok tuk u blumi. Uk pi sikut kneri sivut unganganu. Apa pinak churu to make sure me. Im gakluni nunakshrami bakmani. Ariga matnagu. Parisivut kovernam sinani. Ariga. Matnagu Parisi would govern Sinani. Sinani is the shore. When you box somebody, you see them coming your way from a long way. And as you walk toward each other, you start walking faster. And when you box, you hug. Parisivut kuvernam. We shall meet on that shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Peace to Gary's memory much peace and comfort to his children, to his friends. 
Thank you. Koya Nakpak. Oh, my. That's all I can say. Ah. It's such a deep pleasure to join you all this evening in honoring Gary, such a dear friend and colleague. I want to share a few things tonight that I didn't know about Gary, but gleaned from reading his 20 page resume. Holy moly, what a panoply of achievements. But three details caught my attention in relation to Gary's keen interest in Alaska Native cultures and education and land claims. The first one suggests that teaching school in Naknek was a major trigger for Gary's interest. On his resume, his earliest nonfiction book is listed as Teaching Eskimo Culture to Eskimo People, or excuse me, Teaching Eskimo Culture to Eskimo Students. It was published in 1968 by the Bristol Bay School District. In the synopsis, Gary writes, Eskimo youth in Bristol Bay are caught between the clash of native and white cultures and have difficulty identifying with either culture. Since the existing curriculum in Bristol Bay, excuse me, in Bristol Bay schools ignores the student's cultural background, the author considers the creation of a social studies curriculum about native heritage as a method of dealing with students' problems. In 200 plus pages, Gary describes the location and natural environment of Naknek, its history, the cultures and procedures for enacting his proposed curriculum. I found the whole document on the internet. And I wonder if it's something that Archie Gottschalk knows about or anybody else. I didn't know about it. In 1971 and 72, Gary worked as the director of the bilingual education program for the Alaska state operated school system. I knew about this. What I didn't know was detail number two. During that time, he conceived of and helped pass the state legislation that created and funded the Alaska Native Language Center in Fairbanks. Why should I be surprised? Detail number three, before all that, in 1969, after oil was discovered on the North Slope, Gary testified in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. House hearings on the construction of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, arguing that native land claims need, needed to be settled before construction. And of course, the Native Claims Settlement Act was passed in 1971. And a dozen years later, as Archie Gottschalk and Ted Chamberlain have both talked about, Gary and the Humanities Forum supported the two-year effort of the Alaska Native Review Commission that evaluated the effects of angst statewide. Holt House never ceases to amaze me. Never ceases to amaze me. I knew Gary through my work at the Island Institute in Sitka and through the fact that he and my late husband, Doric Maisho, had been very close friends since they'd met and worked in, as colleagues at Alaska Methodist University. I like to wonder what they're both doing together right now. I first met Gary back in the mid 1980s in the early years of the Sitka Symposium, the program that gradually expanded into the Island Institute. At that time, as director of the Humanities Forum, Gary spent a lot of time traveling the state and he came to Sitka to meet with local people. He invited a group of us to dinner to talk about what the forum was working on and how Sitkans might be a part of it. 
basically encouraging individuals and organizations to partner with the forum and benefit from its grant programs. But there was something else, I think, behind Gary's traveling strategy. As a self-declared humanist, he loved nothing more, I think, than meeting and talking with people about things that mattered most in our lives. He loved bringing the humanities to life. And Gary was somewhat wily about making this happen. He, and he managed to organize most of his professional career so that he could move around community to community, find the local coffee shop or favorite restaurant and sit down to talk and listen. The consequence of Gary's strategy, he was too humble to admit this, was that he touched and influenced hundreds and hundreds of people. His resume is peppered with panels and projects in towns all over Alaska and the American West, many of them titled Up for Discussion about one local concern or another. Decorah, Iowa, Bismarck, South Dakota, Sitka, Alaska, Plainview, Minnesota, Keystone, Colorado, Tulalip, Washington, Anchorage, Alaska. Gary was a presence. People didn't forget him. They took to heart the questions he posed, the ideas he offered, his firm belief in the human enterprise, which he demonstrated again and again. I'll leave you with this legend I heard somewhere. A director of a state humanities council was attending a conference in Mexico City. On the way to his hotel, the cab driver, fluent in English and curious, asked him what kind of work he did. When the man replied that he worked in the humanities, the cab driver said, ah, do you know Gary Holthouse? <laughs> Thanks so much. Wasn't that wonderful? <laughs> We're coming to a close. We have two more people that are going to speak. Um, and, uh, and so I want to make sure to say, take a moment to uh, remind folks that when, once we do close, we really do hope that, that, uh, that people will gather in the lobby. Uh, we do have uh, a few copies of Gary's book. If you're in, interested, you can see Nancy uh, for that. And, um, and we invite you also, if you haven't already, to on the back of your program is, um, is a reading um, from, from Gary. There's a poem back, back there. We encourage you to re read that. Um, and then once uh, our last speaker um, speaks, which is, which is Kevin Holthouse, we'll have uh, Lauren's music once again to, uh, to, to play us out. So I'd first like to introduce um, our first speaker is going to be uh, John Straley. And then following uh, John will be Kevin Holthouse for, uh, for final comments for the evening. Uh, John Straley. Uh, thank you for, to all the speakers. And uh, it's a, as everyone said, the, they're honored to be here. I, I think there's been some terrible mistakes that have been made to include me with some of these people who are so smart and so sensitive and speak so eloquently, but I'll do my best. Um, as crazy as it sounds, in the early 80s, I was terrified of Gary Holthouse. He was about to review a nonfiction manuscript I had written, and I didn't know much about him, but other people I knew were very impressed by Gary Holthouse. Richard Nelson, who at that time was my friend, uh, and surfing partner said, my gosh, Holthouse, has he ever read a lot of books? Oh my gosh, all kinds of books. And I think, I think he understands them. Um, which kind of terrified me. Uh, I had just graduated from the University of Washington where I had studied with the novelist James Welsh. I thought I knew a lot more than I actually did. 
I was the typical pain in the butt English major, and I thought I knew a terrifically important secret. And that secret was that life in the North American West and Alaska could be the stuff of great literature. I thought this was a secret I only knew. Then I met Gary and I realized he had already considered everything I had ever thought in the past. He knew better the things that I was thinking just then. And I even considered that he would always be ahead of my future self. I had no secrets that Gary Holthouse didn't already know. Gary seemed huge to me. I mean, physically, he seemed, as he was coming towards me, I, I thought he was as big as a brown bear. But he had this interesting ability uh, to not seem imposing close up. He had this amazing ability to shrink down to the appropriate size. But still, he frightened me because he was clearly learned, but he never overplayed his intelligence. It was hard to estimate just how smart and well read he was, partly because he was humble. But from the university, I had grown to expect people, intellectuals, men mostly, um, to act as if their intelligence was a Saturday night special, that they would pull on you at any second. But Gary was different. I always felt I could speak freely with Gary. He, he wasn't impressed with my manuscript at the end of the day. <laughs> and it was never published, but I learned a great deal from my failure. Gary was kind. His comments about my manuscript were tough and perfectly on point, clear and helpful. His comments made me a better writer. He both told me that I needed to, what I needed to do, which was read and uh, put myself out into the world. And at the same time, he welcomed me into his world, into this huge community of Alaskan makers and creators. Uh, and I will always be grateful to him for that. Then I started reading Gary's work more seriously, and his presence seemed even more immense. He wrote lyrically and precisely about the effect of the physical world on the cultural life of human residents. Many more writers would pl plow that same ground. Barry Lopez wrote to much acclaim, and Terry Tempest Williams, who was an immense, who has an immense following. But I, to this day, I think Gary was singular in his approach and his success in his writing because Gary had a warm, warm heart for humanity. He loved talking with all kinds of people and he distrusted the impulse towards solipsism, the notion that some people are just magically tuned in to the landscape. I heard a writer once say that they simply took dictation from the mountain. Other writers during this era would claim to be modern shamans. Gary never made grandiose claims for himself. Gary studied the world as he moved through it. He looked at the evidence and he spoke with the people most in touch with his area of interest. Then Gary made his argument, arguments about the best way to educate young people, arguments about the social justice of, and the economy, all the while keeping respect, if not love, for the farmers, mechanics, roustabouts, academics, poets, hunters, medicine men, acknowledged experts, and simply put, just the locals with whom he shared his thoughts. He loved and respected many native writers and intellectual intellectuals, but his respect was based on shared experience and rigorous study. He worked hard to earn their respect, and he didn't simply assume that somehow all Native Americans were just matching. He loved to drink coffee and drive long distances. He was particularly fond of the big empty spaces of the West. He knew these spaces weren't empty, but were the foundation of unique cultures with complex imaginations. He contemplated holiness as he drove and he considered the unique qualities of every person he met. I see him now walking into a lonely diner with his several thermoses of coffee striking up a conversation with someone in the joint who seemed ready to talk. 
He enjoyed simple exchange and he was willing to go anywhere it led. How does a person live? What brings them joy? What was their economy of exchange with one another? Who did they mistrust and why? He claimed to be a simple humanist, but like the dust from ancient exploded stars, his thoughts migrated into everything, everything. In this, I think Gary Holthouse was an important and generous intellectual and a kind, kind man. I could make an argument for many more minutes that his type of mind is exactly what we need urgently, urgently in our country today. But I will just stick with the obvious fact that I loved him and I will miss him. Just as I know that all of you who knew him do too. Thank you. Wow, what a beautiful tribute. I'm just so happy to be here. Uh, all of you speaking make bring memories to me that are uh, just invaluable. So I'm just full of gratitude. Uh, but I want to thank the Humanities Forum, the uh, Quarterly Review, the museum, and special thanks to Carolyn Servage. She's worked really hard behind the scenes writing bios about dad uh, that are so wonderful. Uh, I'll just keep this really short. I, I'm not sure. I didn't know what to read tonight. I uh, grabbed some of his old journaling so that I thought, you know, that's not going to be read by anybody. It's not going to be accessible because you're used to his finished product, which he really worked hard on. Uh, so I thought I'd grab some of his loose journaling that uh, reflects a little bit about, I think it'll show what many of you have talked about, sort of how he thinks and how he operates. Uh, I do have a couple comments, though, because of these memories. Uh, Steve talked about how great the board was at the Humanities Forum. And my dad would always challenge me. So he, when I started doing seminars with uh, teachers up here, Socratic seminars, we called them, he thought you know, that I should do a seminar with the board. So I'm thinking, what kind of opening question, you know? And I asked Dad, I said, it's OK if I ask any question and pick any reading. So I picked Plato, and you know, we read some Socrates stuff. And I uh, had no idea how the board, I didn't know who the board was at all. I just walked in there cold. But I had a, I, what I thought was a great question. I asked him, if Socrates was alive today, could he get a grant from the Humanities Forum? <laughs> <laughs> and that had very mixed results. <laughs> it was a difficult seminar. Uh, but it was a good challenge for me. And it was my dad's idea to get me uh, into doing Socratic seminars in the first place with uh, students up here and teachers up here. Uh, Doric and my dad both uh, really paved the way for that for me to happen, for that to happen for me. Um, so I thought I'd read a little, this is just uh, poorly written, just quick journal notes basically is all this is. And I have quite a few uh, files full of that stuff because he would share that with me and we would, you know, I'd write notes on it and we'd bounce things back and forth. This one, he's leaving Boise. He says, I was inspired to wash the van, which had needed it since Utah. So I stopped and did a thorough job. On the way up to Ontario, an early evening deer bolted from a depression in the median strip. I swerved, tearing precariously along a deep shoulder two wheels in the burrow pit, ripping up grass and wheat and spewing gravel, sloughing around and swerving back onto the interstate, the rocking reminding me again of Bristol Bay. <laughs> Stopped at the next exit to survey the damage, the van was looking like the machine from Oz, wisps of yellow straw and grass sticking out of every angle, stuck between the grill and the hood like a mouth dangling spaghetti even trapped under the windshield wipers. Alas, a big spray of gasoline from the tank and a big leak that seemed of something else, like brake fluid or oil maybe, couldn't tell what it was. Checked the exhaust and muffler especially carefully, made sure there would be no errant sparks when I started up. 
Despite Robert Frost, I have no desire to go in either fire or ice. <laughs> Went on into the Ontario, everything, everything closed, checked into Motel 6. Luckily, only three blocks from a Dodge garage. Lucky day. Uh, the van was a Dodge van. Spent the rest of the evening reading and typing. Wednesday, August 6th, uh, took the van to the Dodge folks at 7 a.m., was first in line when they opened. They finally got it up on the hoist about 10 o'clock, and I got a good look underneath. It definitely needed a new tank and the radiator blown, etc. Can you do it all for about $250, the man said. Have to order a tank from out of town. When I asked about driving it, he said, I sure wouldn't recommend that. One spark and you depart this world and we'd never see you again. <laughs> then tomorrow, when the new tank comes, who'd pay for it? Be a terrible thing for us. <laughs> he, he finished laughing. Um, being a coward from way back, I left it. Had plenty to do, enough to think about, phone calls to make. Besides, uh, I'm in a great spot, though far out on the edge of this sprawly town. For entertainment, Kmart sits in the top, like the Taj behind its reflecting parking. There's a copper kitchen a couple blocks away, and if I decide to go gourmet, a Dairy Queen next door to that. <laughs> if I get bored, I can go to Kmart, see if they have what I'm missing. Yes, sir, brains are all over aisle 17, way back on the left. Uh, sorry, sir, but we're out of good looks, especially come on Friday. But I'll be back by then. Or did I'll be gone by then? Be glad to hold on to him for you. Anyway, this goes on and on, but uh, it's fun to read the the rough writing sometimes instead of the finished work. Um, but that's I think it sort of shows the material was almost anything, uh, any kind of material he would use for writing. It also shows that we were lucky we had him around for 90 years because there were several you know brushes with fate that could have gone a different way. Uh, so I feel really lucky to have been able to spend time with him. Uh, another thing I want to say, because I think a lot of you people uh, in, the, in the crowd, I may know you from when I first got out of high school and came up here to catch up with my dad to make up for some lost time. Because his house was a wide open, doors open, anything goes place. And so I thought, you know, I'm gonna come up and catch up with my dad he was hardly ever there, but I stayed in the basement. And turns out, I never knew who was gonna be upstairs in the morning. Some of you, I'm sure, maybe, uh, were there, uh, because it was just a place where if you wanted to hitchhike up to Alaska, you knew that address, you could go to that house and it would be open. And somebody would be there, probably not me even, somebody would be there to cook breakfast or play some music or do something. And I met a lot of great people there I spent a year and a half doing that. Uh, saw him very little, but met all kinds of artists and writers and musicians, and whoever happened to show up in Anchorage, they knew they had a place to stay. Um, so that was really an exciting time for me. That was an education, uh, you know, in the sort of a new environment for me to meet all those kinds of folks. And so I think that represents his lifestyle in general. It's just so open and willing to listen and house and you know meet all kinds of characters didn't matter who uh, so anyway that's uh you know we miss him a lot but i feel the same way that many of you do that he's still with us all the time so thank you so much it's been a great time This is called An End for Dreaming from Unexpected Manna. Some dreams are best kept hid, cupped in hands behind the back, or stored in little boxes in the dark. Lifted up to view, they wheel and cry, scatter like gulls over empty oceans. Exposed to air, they bleed, burn like fractured suns falling from a sky.